Hey guys, and welcome to another week of Untier Talk. Today, we don't just have me and Hajad, we also have PU Snake Starter, PU Grand Slam semifinalist, uh, former council member, and undisputed number one PU extraordinaire, Tedsworth. Yo, uh, you got something wrong there. I believe I was slammed finalist, not, not semi-finalist. Sorry, but I meant we'll, we'll, second we'll, place. We'll, we'll, I meant second place finisher, but yeah, semifinals would be tied oh, for. Oh, that still hurts. Tied for third. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, winner of the PU. I don't know. Pick any tour in Oras. <laughs> it was either you or Dundee's. So it's like a fifty-fifty chance. I miss that one guy. But there was that. There's one guy that upset both of you. That never turned up ever again after. Forget what? his name. Are you talking about the fifty? Whatever his name is. The fifty MPH. Something like. That. Yes, that dude. That oh, dude he turned up for like one tour because he hacks the shit out of me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. No, he played in a few, and then people were like, "You're bad. You're just lucky," and he got really mad and quit. But it's because he was bad and lucky. But that's not the point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the point the point is we have snake games coming to you, and the first one is yours versus Jerry's in chronological order. So you seem uniquely qualified to start on this one. Yeah. So going into this game, um, you can see Hakmo well, Lipard. So yeah, but I don't think either of those bonds particularly are bad, and I think. They actually work pretty well. I saw Absol being used uh, week one, and I was just thinking speed tiers in PU are pretty slow. Having strong as fuck pursuit and knock, it's it's, it's not you know it's something to go with. Quick so, question: like, Do you think Hakama O or Lipard is the better Pokemon in PU? Oh, definitely Lipard. Lipard's genuinely good. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like. Lightpod has been super underexplored, hasn't it? Especially with the the CB copycat stuff. Like you can do a lot of good, like breaking and almost like revenge killing as well with that set. Mm. I mean, I'm I'm big on it, purely because uh, the speed tier it outspeeds some threatening Pokemon uh, like Semiseer, um, Semisage, and uh, Semipore. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good list. All That's three list. really threatening Pokemon. They're, they're threatening to, like, standard, oh, Teddy's just going to bring Bulky, let's bring Nasty Plot, Monkey. So I'm like, ha ha, one step ahead of you, you're going to get trapped. Who did we have last week? So we, someone... What? Wait, I, I thought you were talking about uh, on Teddy's team. Never no, on, on, on Tier Talk, didn't we have... No, but I think it was you. Specs. No, it was just you, and no, yeah, just, and you were yeah. you were trying to name things that would beat Hajad's team, and I think you actually said Simiseer and Simi Sage, and that was all you could name. What is what is it? What is it with with seeing Teddy's teams and going, "Yep, monkeys will beat that." It's just been a meme. It's almost been like a meme since like Oras. Like, this is a bulky core. Use nasty plot monkey because it beats bulky core. Like, it's it's a really like almost lazy way of thinking mm. about it without really needing to put too much thought into it. Yeah, I, or yeah. maybe it's just the Shane Ghoul influence on you guys. Yeah, that too. Yeah, no, it could possibly be that. But um, either way, I'm trying to be quite conscious on covering my weaknesses uh, from, you know, past weeks and, uh, you know, my teams. So, hence Hakamo for role compression. Uh, where it like checks the victory bell and other things, um, mm. and the lipod's there to revenge and trap, and I think it's got a really nice speed tier, and uh, it knocks off the mudsdale as well, so it gets rid of the berry. Yeah, I like how you have a lot of redundancy too between the scar frostlass and then the pranks through copycat lipod, like you're not really going to lack options. Like, sure, in theory, if you looked at the team, Smash Omastar, for example, like you don't have strict defensive checks to that, but what you do have is a lot of um, redundancies to take it out anyway. So it gives you a lot of leeway to not necessarily oh, yeah. like see this and go, oh, well, I can't beat that, because you, you can beat like anything with, with those. You're not getting swept. 
Yeah, uh, I actually had uh, Scarf HP Grass Frostlass. Really? For for Omastar? For Omastar, yeah. Because I figured people might try and bring Smashes versus me. Mm -hmm. At least, like, it's very cool. I think people are going to try and take an obscure view to the meta versus me or just try and, you know, go for the matchup. Um, typically, I feel pretty comfortable in the, you know, the Muds Eel versus Muds Eel, and I can, you know, I've I, I played a bunch of those series in my PU Open run, uh, whereby, like, I feel pretty comfortable outplaying and I'm familiar with the scenarios. So when I'm playing someone like Ziri, who I don't think has played too much PU recently, uh, I was kind of, you know, confident that if I were to go into a scenario where he would bring bog standard versus me, I'd yeah, be able to take advantage of that. Yeah, it's actually interesting. Yeah. Ziri qualified for Slam, but with like no PU, it was all um, UU and RU, or UU and NU, or RU and NU, something like that. Um, I think he did really well in RU Open. I know, it, yeah, okay, it was RU and then either UU or NU, and yeah, he did fall back on the uh, Mud's Eel, Jellicent Ape, like, pretty fat stuff with the uh, Turtonator kind of being the nod to, hey, I want to smash on Teddy. Um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, oh, sorry, I, I did a small scout on him, and every single team he used in PUPL had a Scarf Prime Ape. Really? Interesting. Yeah, I think he's very, very lazy when it comes to his speed control. Dang, that's a, called that's an out. Interesting perspective. Tlena, if you're listening, you know what to do. Yeah, I, I just wanted to have a quick word on, on Ziri's team just quickly before we move on to the game. I think it's almost like, yeah, like as Teddy said, like it was, it's almost like a, a lazy way of building. I think when you, PU at the moment is very like ceiling where the better player will win majority of the time. I feel like that's how we've constructed the meta almost, where there isn't much in terms of um, really weird things that you can bring that will just throw somebody who's really good at the game like off. Um, I think bas Ooh. basically how the meta works is if you bring standard, the better player will still beat standard. Like um, We saw that in PUPL where um, you know, we, me... Ted and Dibs, we used to build a lot of Muds, Eel, Muds, uh, Reggie Eel type teams in the knowledge that the better players that we had on our team would be able to like outskill their way into advantageous positions. But I feel like it works both ways that a really good player can make it work, but a not so good player can also make it like because these monsters don't really have recovery as well, so you need to be super efficient with them. Yeah, so, it's. Yeah, it's it's an extremely safe pick from Ziri. The mud, the the mud eel Vic kind of meta that I see. I don't think these mons are like as good as they're cracked up to be because really, um, it's it's extreme. It's extremely safe. I look at Ziri's team. and I don't think they're like too desperately weak to anything exactly. Although, yeah, there there are definitely some mons like Specs Aurorus would definitely or like Hail in general would definitely give this a bit of a run for its money. But really, like, it's just a very safe kind of way to take it you know i'm gonna hope that my team doesn't outright lose to anything and then hope turtonator is gonna be able to win the game for me and uh yeah. that didn't that didn't work out at all like turtonator had a pr pretty reasonable matchup here teddy teddy's fire resist being hackmo -O, but it certainly wasn't enough because there was just uh too much like the constant like speed control as well yeah i also wanted to add just quickly like i would have liked you were saying quickly about like the hail the hail weakness. I think that's kind of a good meta read on Ted's part, where he's like, hail is generally viewed by the community as like an anti offense tool, right? Like you see Scarfroras and SD Lotus action. That's like that's really good versus offense, but you don't usually like associate it with being good versus Teddy style of teams, which are usually much bulkier. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good meta read. Like you don't want to bring. That it would be crazy to bring, let's say, anti offense versus somebody who's famous for bringing stool, for example. Well, I, I was I was talking about Ziri's team being hail weak. Teddy's te Teddy oh, definitely. I thought you were talking about Ted's, yeah. Teddy Teddy definitely like has some hail issues too, but hail in general is a really weird matchup. Where even though like yeah, on paper, 
Uh, both the Ice Mons are going to do a lot of breaking versus both. There's always a lot of room to outplay Hail. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like Sun, where you'll just like, oh, they have Sun. I kind of just get smacked, you know. Yeah, I feel like Sundo is just bad in this meta. Well, it is because like, you know, of, you'll just speed tie with bullets. their victory bell, and then it sucks to suck. Okay, we should really yeah. get. In, it's been like ten minutes. We haven't gotten into this game. That's true. Um. Teddy, do you want to lead it off? Your game, so. Yeah, so uh, I was looking at the matchup. Um, I figured five out of six of his team were meta. I could predict sets from preview. Uh, I figured Skunk was going to be some sort of mixed fire blast because there's there's no way he's going to be hard by Victory Bell in this meta. Mm-hmm. Um, I just predicted standard defensive jelly. Uh, Reggie Eel, uh, no, Mud Eel, Scarf Ape, and then it was just about guessing the uh, Turtonator set. So, I, if it was sub, well, I, I assumed it was sub Smash uh, based off some of the tests I had with teammates and discussion uh, with players in the meta. So, I was just very cautious about that. Uh, so, when it came to lead matchup, uh, I didn't think he would lead straight away with his wing con. I just figured uh, he would he would lead Eel, and uh, I'd be able to get off a powerful knockoff, get rid of his berry, start putting on some pressure. But when he actually leads with Tur, I'm actually thinking, uh oh, if he smashes, uh, this could actually be really problematic if he smash Z uh, Draco. Yeah. So it... I end up I end up U turning into Muds, and I chew a fire blast. And at this point here, I'm thinking, oh shit, he's actually got the chip on my muds. What do I do if he clicks the Draco here? So in turn, by turn three, I'm actually full on willing to sack Hakamo to the Z Draco. And it just so happens that he's not Z Draco and that he switches out into Eel. And then it makes it sort of look like I predicted that. But in reality, I was quite just sacking the, the little dinosaur there. Mm-hmm. I think it is. I think it is kind of noteworthy that like H- Hakamo definitely didn't see its niche come out, come out in this game at all. It checks, you know, the, like we discussed the Costa and the Victor Bell, and sure here here it like can be a stop to Eel, but for the most part, um, it's a very unique mon that didn't really get to show that off at all. But I think I, yeah, I feel I like the tide to- the tide turned really early here. Like in both series games, they start out. It looking really not so good at all where you get like a lot of eel a lot of chip on the eel very early uh the dragon tail chip on turtonator very early absolutely absolutely worth the hagma o getting weakened like just generally a lot of damage to where even though the hagma o dies very early um you still looked amazing and, and that's even before the protect rotom came out which was absolutely huge here yeah I- a lot of new players, if they're listening right now, I think can like gain that or benefit from learning from like how Ted plays, is that he was he already understood on his mom like the least most useful Pokemon on his team was by turn two, right? He was prepared to fodder off the hack mode because it did the least amount of work, and a lot of players they will try and like pivot around to try and like not lose a Pokemon when in reality the best play is to just sack off something that isn't useful at all to your game plan. In the end, Ted managed to get a lot of value from Hakamo for a nothing one, essentially. Like, it wasn't doing anything in the game. But he managed to get a lot of chip on Tessinator, which is well worth it, as you said. Mm. And um, you did see, like, due to the Protect Rotom, Ziri was trying to do that pivoting. Definitely was a, a bit more successful in that regard. Not entirely detrimental, but that was very huge. And I do like the Protect Rotom. It doesn't have like an amazing last move once you have defog dual stabs and uh, like like you know you knew the scarf ape was coming, you knew they were using so much scarf ape that yeah it ab- absolutely worked out here for a really uh, a very strong opening, and then it slowly like you're strong for a very long time in this game. Um, just consistently reading Ziri, you know, like where you get the toxic on the Jellicent as they try to recover, uh, things like that. And then when... The... It... No, okay, go ahead. 
I was, I was going to say the turning point was when he manages to kill Mudsdale without me getting the burial. Mm. With the uh, twinkle tackle, interestingly enough, we weren't really all that. No, I, I, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, I don't agree with the set. I think he was maybe scared of like save lie from week one, but again, he's got like he's got enough on his team to deal with that or Spiritum maybe. So bringing it, bringing Z Fairy Skuntag, I just don't agree with that. But it manages to work out for him. I think in reality, uh, I should have probably played a little bit more aggressive with Victory Bell. Um, but by turn thirty-three, uh, I only saw Fire Blast. I didn't see what his set was, so I didn't want to chew a Fire Blast. And then um, you were still thinking the Turtonator was Z as well, maybe. Yeah, maybe Z. Uh, I was still thinking it was Z Turt. Yeah, uh, because I didn't see an item, and that's what I would run yeah. on his team. Z Turt, and then uh, on this kind of skunk, I've been running like Iapapa. Uh, even is, is is a solid option. So I I definitely wasn't predicting that I think kind of thing. The real misplay from me there was not calculating the fire blast damage on mods. Yeah, Second that's what I was going to say. It was yeah. uh, no investment. I could have uh, played turn 33 a lot better, but I ended up switching Victory Bell out into Muds, uh, trying to chew a Fire Blast to activate the berry, and he tackles me, kills me. Yeah. So even though I've got like a 5-3 lead, I'm down to 4-3. I defog away the rocks because I wanted Frostlass to be able to sweep uh, at some point. And for my Pokemon to just come in freely. Yeah, and then it comes yeah. down to like an actually kind of close 3v3 where Skunk like does well versus the rest of the Mons. Scarf Primeape is actually problematic. Like it, it yeah. just ended up really coming in close due to that one thing where like I, I have Papa Mudsdale uh, can all, can almost be a bit of a dangerous Mon even though we see it as such a stable thing because uh, if they're able to somehow handle the berry then you really feel uh, it, its absence here, how much it was needed to uh, keep the skunk and the ape in check and how much like Ziri wasn't, shouldn't have been able to switch into it at all because the eel died very early, but uh, got it out of the way anyway. Yeah, I think up until about turn 40, uh, he actually probably should have won that. Um but he clicked U-turn with Primate. Yeah, that was for that was the big thing. Reason. I I did think he won on on turn forty. Um, he's got the Primate bin. If he earthquakes, yeah. If he earthquakes, it's gonna two it KO the Victory Bell coming in, and then he should win from there. And he U-turns, and I was thinking like you might have even. I wasn't sure if you were gonna stay in with Lipard, expecting the earthquake or something. Um. I'm not sure, like, was that something you considered, or were you just trying to play to save as possible? Or Well, if he did Earthquake there, um, I, uh, I could have copycatted it. I was thinking along the lines of, I've got to somehow get to the point where um, Lipi can sweep for me. But yeah. the thing is... Uh, it was just a bit of a case of I was playing that turn by turn trying to get the reads on him. The fact that he U-turned did me a massive favor because I went into Lipard on the Fire Blast because he was playing safe because he had the advantage here. And then I was thinking, okay, click the knockoff. If he switches in Ape, I knock off the Scarf, win with Lipard. Then I'm thinking, okay, sacking Jelly, he's just going to click Wisp, he's just going to click Hex. Any of those two, um, recover, it doesn't matter. So, used it as an opportunity to go into Victory Bell. No way he's doubling into Skuntank or Prime Open risking the knock. So it gives me an opportunity to um, strength staff up. Because obviously he's dying to Toxic. What's the point in me, you know? Yeah, get, get the Victory Bell healthy, takes the hit from Skunk, and then from there it's... Uh, a solid yeah. win with copycat 
uh, with Scar Frost last plus copycat, a, a pretty guaranteed win there. So yeah, when he goes to Skuntank, if he killed me, I went into Lipard and I copycatted his Fire Blast, and I'm pretty sure I killed the Skuntank and the Primeape, and then Scar Frost last did what it needed to just so happened that i lived whatever move he went for um it was the Bell. it was the uninvested fire blast. it actually had a zero percent chance to kill there if he was fully uninvested so and obviously i get the the cursed bodied cursed body and i could have you know played the uh the villain and you know click knock off or something <laughs> just to um let him die to struggle but just clicking the copycat to just show that I would have had the win from that position. Well, crit struggle might have even killed. Lifeguard frail. I don't think so. That I think no that way. All right. there's no That's way. I'm calculating scarf primate crit struggle. Okay. Can struggle you, crit? You it's 50 non stab. Struggle can Means crit, right? No, I don't. No, I don't think so. Uh, struggled is 45 to 53. Lifeguard was at 55. And that that's on a crit struggle. So, so I don't know if struggle can time. crit, but it can in the calc. Okay. All right, I'm looking up the struggle anyway. can crit. It's not important at all, and we should move on to the next game, but I very much want to know if it can crit. Uh, it, it can in Gen 1. And... They never say it can't anymore in later generations. So it looks like struggle can crit. I think just like the key points in this game though will probably um I think the the knock turn on the Rotom Frost that gave me such an early advantage. The mud's dying to um the Z fairy move. And then obviously the user instead of like EQ or gunk. Mm -hmm. I think those were like the three like key moments in this battle that really like set the tone. And in terms of ideas, yeah. um, Protect Rotom did an awful lot. R Rotom in general did an awful lot. Protect especially. And it was I think it was kind of critical that the Turtonator did not do very much work. Uh, despite like, you know, turn, turn one getting the big fire blast chip on the Mudsdale. It did very little after that. Chip the Hakama O, the one thing that you didn't need. So. Because <laughs> it sucks. You don't need it. He really should have just smashed him. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't Z. So he probably was like, I can't kill the Mudsdale. I'm going to chip it now. And then I can smash later. Well, yeah. He, I think he was White Herb. And if he was White Herb, I went to Muds. I chewed whatever hit he went for. And then I sacked the Hakamo the next turn after clicking EQ, and then I re revenged with um, Frostlass or Copycat Lipard. But apparently he was Protect. Protect Turtonator? Yeah, he what? was not sub, he was Protect. So he was Protect, Smash, Dual Stab. Why? Protect is what? I think it's for, like, fake outs. Oh, I mean, I no idea. okay, so you can protect on fake out Kangaskhan, but other than that, it's not, like, Rotom is the kind of thing that they'll go Scarf Ape versus, and they'll be like, I don't want to lock myself into close combat, they have a Frostlass in the back, they're probably switching out, I can U-turn, and protect Rotom's like, well, you know, now you can't play the mind game of U-turning on a switch out or close combating on a stay-in, whereas, like, with Turtonator, that's not the kind of thing you pivot out of, you know? Well, maybe it would, like, take advantage of Prime Apes, where they're like, oh, no, I really want to... Pro you, know, you don't U turn. You don't U turn on a plus two turn. You don't U turn on a post smash turtonator though. But let's say you like, it's lead lead matchup turt versus primate. So it's for you lead. It's for that. specifically leading with turn. I don't know. I that seems like a a big reach. Well, he did lead with turt. I guess, but I I honestly think it's more likely that they just thought you were bringing Kangaskhan. Maybe that too. Anyway, anyway, anyway game, uh, two. game two, Ryza versus Gary the Gengar. Damn, that we took forever on that game. This one's probably going to go by really fast because I think we can just agree Gary's team, uh, once again, just didn't work. And and Ryza's did, and, and he played it fine, and so he just won the game. Yeah, I don't think we need to even go into 
depth and the plays, to be honest, because Ryzen literally just won the game. As he soon as the safe play. Yeah, he, de- he didn't make any plays at all. He just played, like, Prime Ape for the late game, and he didn't even need to use it in the late game either. So, like, it was chalk from there. Yeah. I think positives on this game, like, you look at Ryzen's team, and Ryzen's team so far this tour as well, like, he looks super good. I feel like... I like his team, team a lot, a bit, yeah. Like, his, his team's building overall in the last couple of games a bit looked really nice and really solid. And uh, being a builder myself, I can appreciate when somebody builds like a, a nice team that's not too passive, not too like frail. Mm, yeah, um, so I'm somewhat of like a builder just, myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like... <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Megazard. Very cool. Um, yeah, like... <laughs> You can you can we can appreciate this type of stuff, um, but I think that's where the positives on this game sort of end, because as people who listen to this podcast on a regular basis understand, I am by no means a fan of like Scyther at all. Okay, if you are going to use Scyther, <laughs> oh come on, that wasn't the fighting resist, that wasn't the only problem not, with this team. No 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 no, he's no, also using it, a Hitmonchan. He's he's using a Hitmonchan, and then. Uh, there's just so many things he's wrong using with the without Sunslash. So he had, he had, you know, the hail. Oh, okay. In in a song. singular defense, there, I think Solo Aurorus could actually come back a bit. On the other hand, he's using Aurorus on a team that is pretty Sandslash weak. Hitmonchan doesn't really switch in. Like he has Reggie Rock, and that's it. So he has he has nothing that switches into anything. No. Like, yeah. His ones are so in, like his team is such an individual mon by individual mon team that I don't think it could be more individually like selected if he could have tried. Like lot... Lorantis, usually with usually when you have Lorantis, uh, you'd have a Vicky check somewhere on your team because yeah, like, you know, uh, that's, that's you know like yeah. Spent time. But his victory or, bell check yeah, was like literally the first time he had to switch into victory bell. He pivoted in his Aurora's on the sludge bomb. That's that's not safe. Like okay. I, I hang out in the Trainers uh, Academy room a lot, and I play Anything Goes, so I'll, I'll click on Anything Goes teams when people post them. And the most common mistake you see with Anything Goes, besides people using, like, you know, I'm going to use I'm gonna use my Mega Gardevoir and my Bidoof and whatever, is, is that they'll, like, slap on six legendaries, because, like, they're legendaries, they're strong, I don't, you know, why do I need to build more? And then you look at the team, you're like, none of these Pokemon are individually bad, but they don't make any sense together, because you just thought they were good Pokemon. And that's this, yeah. except it's also not just good Pokemon, there's also Scyther and Hitmonchan. Wait, hang on a second. Exactly, like, yeah, that's it. Do you play Anything Goes? Yeah, I'm anything goes leader. Oh, okay, no, I was just check in. No, continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, all the every untier, my guy, every untier. Um, yeah, I, w- I was gonna say exactly that. Like, it's not only that the mons are so individual; like, they don't do anything to support each other. Like, the the mo- I'm making a leap here. I'm hoping that that uh, Absol has some pursuit on it so that it can support somewhat the prime uh, the hit on channel on that team so t- if there is a spin blocker maybe you can get the spin off spoiler but even then, yeah like I am reaching there because Absol generally doesn't like to run pursuit unless it's like no. choice band and if it was choice band he could have done something this this, this was this was banded it. this was banded Absol and on banded Absol I would assume pursuit that's like star was the one who started using and people were like oh let's start spamming absol and star was using pursuit absol specifically so i definitely wouldn't be surprised um but yeah nothing here came together and rise has got like a cool he's got the future site mashana check check future site mashana tech we saw from last week with the uh absol uh to kind of abuse it because obviously you know you want to switch in girder so if mashana future sites goes absol clicks knockoff what are you doing that's a cool concept. I like it. Yeah, and just this was a very free win. Very free win. This is, I'm willing to wager, this is probably the freest win that we're going to see in the entirety of Snake. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I've yet to play you. So, <laughs> tr- well, I'm not playing. You think that, you think that isn't happening? Yeah, you mean play false, I think. Speak, speaking of false, the next, the next game is Katut versus False. The, uh, the big 
uh, fuck you to when Hijad says, I think PU is at the place where the better player always has the chance to outplay and win and there's not enough cheese because uh, Katut brought some, brought, brought some screens. Weird I, screens. I weird like so screens that lose to Victory Bell, but yeah. Yeah, I feel like this is what Katut does when his back is so, somewhat against the wall. Um, he sort of plays for like weird matchups and like matchup based teams. So stuff like screens, store, I, weather, that type of stuff is kind of like up Katut's alley. Um, when he's like not really like feeling it, I don't think he's feeling it at the moment. So yeah, I would say I think I think it was tricking that said uh, he had some Vicky techs, like some things to hit Vicky. I think it was like Zen headbutt. Uh, Silvali Fairy and like Ice Punch Gerda so he had things for Vicky but obviously it's still a Vicky weak team so really, you think that this is Katut not feeling himself? This is what I think of when yes. Katut is feeling himself no I think he resorts to he resorts to more meme stuff when he doesn't really feel comfortable like playing people head on but this is I mean? like this like in, in his in PU circuit uh, playoffs for example like this was the kind of stuff he was bringing consistently I would assume he was feeling on at that point so I don't know we can't know but yeah I th- anyway. yeah I thought he was bringing more like more balanced teams with like, like niche Pokemon but this is more just like six niche Pokemon you know what I mean well, hey, Judd. Ready? Yeah. Enough of enough of the KTAT team, because I really, yeah. really want to find out. Yeah. <laughs> what was going through your mind when you built this team? I understand the whole breakers on paper. If you're if you're facing this and you've brought a fairly bulky team, you're literally shitting it. Yeah. But you also don't really have a solid fighting resist. And you're the one who thinks Girder is an S rank Pokemon, so. Keep that in mind when well, you answer. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I was when I built this team. It was originally Cobra, Cobra Jellison, um, and another thing that I was also somewhat criticised for uh, when Foster used this team was that I was Lorantis weak. Um, I because it is told, yeah, because it is Lorant. I told False about the Lorantis weakness. Like I warned him about it, and I told him that Kitao might try and abuse that weakness. Because historically, Lorantis always does well versus me. So it's and like, it, and you know, it did. Yeah. And, and it does. Huh. Um, that, that doesn't help false. So, like, hey, false, I get smacked no. by this. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, but, <laughs> then you get smacked by it. Wait, no, not really. I'm saying false played the first few with Drampo such that he managed to break through the majority of Katut's like, team, especially after he crit the Electrode. There, was, there should have been no way that he lost the game. I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah, for well, example, the crit did not help. It just gave Electro... It just gave Katut an extra turn of screens. I don't know why that was... Yeah, that's what I feel like. I also feel like the Gerda just... Behind, you know, light screen, what was killing it? Yeah, like, okay, he looked good. The Drampa did some solid work in, in the earlier parts of the game, and obviously it could have been Z, uh, Z parting shotted for, like, the effect of healing, which it, it got... You know, yeah. it, it killed the Electrode and the Omastar and the Claydol. That's all cool. But even so, I, th- I it really looked like Girder was just going to win the game, even if even if Lorantis somehow didn't, because Girder well, Girder just. I mean, I basically <laughs> what happens is if Jellicent is at full, um, it should be able to one v one Girder with cursed body plus like uh, recovering a lot plus taunt. Like that's 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 a scenario that we've played with. Like that that's usually what happens. But you're however. Like- yeah, no, like that wasn't me. Obviously, uh, False made that decision, but in and theory, he should he have still torn. been able to beat it. Well, it was torn when I gave it to him. So, unless that was changed, that's that's what we were going with. So, um, well, I, yeah. I admit there was a very weird choice where the Silvali Fairy uh, sword stances on the Dramp at minus two, and False decides to go Persian and then parting shot to Jellicent and try to use Jellicent to force that out. And I was thinking, like, maybe if he really did just, like, try to completely preserve Jellicent for early games. So, like, if he went Stoutland and hit Frustration and then, like, sack Stoutland to Girder and then tried to, like, call out when Lorantis would come in by going hard into his Rotom, then, like, maybe that could have happened the par- instead of trying to go with the parting shot plays. But... Yeah, also, on top of that, like, 
Kentucky did end up rolling the, the the superpower on the Rotom as well, so that kind of screwed with the the Rotom potentially being able to kill off the Lorantis. It just made it like a, a bit harder to get that okay. one out of there. I see that, but let me let me riddle me this. Okay, so you you powered it in Rotom on the Lorantis. It's turn sixteen that I'm looking at. The Lorantis is at. 59% is going to go up to 65% and it's clicking Sleep Talk this turn. So it's going to click and attack either Leaf Storm or Superpower and either way the Rotom is not going to Or Rest. It. It, can, still got... it can pull Rest. Yeah, that's true. But there's still three turns of Light Screen left. And Blizzard is not going to kill Lorantis behind Light Screen. I'm assuming it's for death because... I think it's Fizz Death. Oh, based on the meteor mash damage, I think it was face death. Okay, so let's say let's say Rotom gets the hit off, like a hit, and then Lorantis is going to kill the Rotom after that. Well, I think I think instead of attacking think... the Rotom, now I think he should have gone to Stoutland. Yeah, Stoutland I agree with that as well. One of what every, every, any hit. That's if that's what we were discussing in the Discord. Reflect. In in the Discord after because Stoutland isn't gonna die. Ideally, he doesn't pull superpower because if he does, then he might be able to rest up if he's fist depth with the plus one defense. But even then, yeah, then you can at least try to get Rotom in uh, when the screen's not up, and then once you do then that, you maybe Silvali Fa- like maybe Silvali Fairies can revenge your Rotom. But ideally, at that point, that's when Jellicent is supposed to win the game because you like you only have jellicent and the persian to beat the silvali fairy and girder and girder it's not great but like jellicent's supposed to beat the girder so you better hope it does yeah also consider the um consider the stoutland you should have probably bought the stoutland before like trying to z z dark pulse the uh the Lorantis with the light screen up yeah then you would have actually got the revenge kill I think that was just a pure like misplay. There, that was that should have definitely happened. I feel like I feel like floundered the late game really badly. Yeah, yeah. I think Foss had a more than decent enough chance to win. He would have had a better chance to win, like a much better chance if he used the sets that I had suggested or the team, like the, the team in its original form, had actually. Where you throw your the player Colber, under the bus? The Colbert Torn. It had the Colbert Torn uh, Jellison, and it had like the Tex. Uh, if it was Colbert Torn, it would beat Gerda one v one. Yeah, yeah, and Katad also, like, when he Leaf Stormed the Jellicent instead of resting, I guess he was looking to not get taunted, but I don't like that, uh... I don't don't love that choice. Like, Jellicent actually did have a chance to win that game, which probably should not have happened. Like, if he'd just called out the taunt and then gotten the first uh, cursed body possible, or, like, if he called out bulk up with taunt gotten the first cursed body on the recover he still might have even been able to win but he wasn't torn he was just a wisp i'm pretty sure no he was still unless unless he's taunt scald no he was taunt wisp hex recover right no no scald i think no he scalded he scalded the Laurentis. no he never scalded he hexed the Laurentis. yeah he hexed it it never revealed scald and i'm just assuming it's taunt wisp hex recover it has oh. to be. Well, that's the only set that I would have. Uh, yeah, Wispex recover was the like I, I, I'm like at the end of the battle now. Like Wispex recover. Yeah, that's all it showed. Field. You got you got to assume the last move was taunt. I'm pretty sure False even talked about like maybe if I'd gotten the taunt off, but I thought he was going to play it safe and just knock off first instead of bulking up. But I mean, Wispin was never the play. Wisp yeah, did absolutely was, nothing for him, but that seems yeah. like just giving up. Yeah, no, Wisp was giving up. I think if he had taunted. He could have potentially outplayed the Gerda. Well, I say outplayed. He could have like played if the he, cursed body he statistics. Taunted, cursed bodied, the first knock, and then recovered, yeah. recovered, recovered, and then clicked hex on it gradually. Like maybe if you lose your item. He has to switch out because he's got nowhere to hit you. Yeah. You win that. You win the game from there. Yeah, and and exactly. I don't like that Katut put himself in that place like he should not have had a chance to lose this especially after false kind of you know made those weird uh late game plays we're talking about where like jellicent genuinely could have just beat katut that shouldn't have happened but uh it it didn't it didn't matter anyway he he got the he got the win i think the only positive from this game i see is that av drum play is absolutely monstrous Mm. 
That that did some work. I'll take credit for that. Uh, right, I don't like you anymore. But, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think personally, from my perspective, as like being the builder, I feel like the team did the job it was supposed to do. Like it, the each individual mod was supposed to do that thing. I feel like if uh, the sets were more optimized to what I thought was more like beneficial. I've spoken to Falls already about like potentially Fighters plus Pursuit and Laurentis. We we discussed that and he thought he was it was fine. And I think like the the plan versus Laurentis was more so to like if he kills one with Laurentis, you go into Drampa and you kill one back. Like it was I feel I felt like he should have been much more like comfortable in those scenarios where it's like you sack one, he sacks one, he sacks one, you sack one. Like um Mm. But it turned out that he was much more nervous in those scenarios than I thought he might have been. So I don't know. I, I still I definitely a... want to put a good chunk of the blame on this team. Like, Girder... Yeah, the, the fact that we have to say, you know, False's chances stemmed from him getting early cursed bodies, that's kind of a problem. Cursed body is is good, but it's not it's not a perfectly reliable method to stop this Pokemon. It just isn't. Um, yeah, sure. But I think, I, th- I still think it would be like, it would be like, Jettison is supposed to be good. Like that's still a thing that happens. So, um, I don't know. I don't know how much you can like pin it on the, like Jettison isn't like a good gutter check or like however you want to put it. It's mm-hmm. like, it should have never been lefties. And I just feel like, yeah. Yeah. All well, that too. I don't know. Yeah. But I think uh, we've, we've said enough. Above. Yeah, and and speaking of games with almost no redeeming factors, uh, Tom Holland versus Sam I Am. Holy shit! Right. The largest bug I've ever seen just ran past on the floor. I have <laughs> no idea what the, was that a cockroach? Okay, anyway. <laughs> That's a weird thing to call Aaron Boyer. Oh my! What? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Are you anti-pro traditional <laughs> marriage people? No, I'm very pro traditional marriage. <laughs> Okay, um, so anyway, everyone, including Tom, can agree the main thing that this game came down to was he did not play a good game of Pokemon, and we can talk about that. Can I, think- I just say though that I don't think I've, I've heard a lot of people guess up Tom Holland's matchup here, but I look at the matchup and I've analysed it. I just don't. I don't agree. I feel like Tom's team has positive aspects to it, similar to Ziri, whereby like Ziri brought the Terminator, hoping to six zero my team. Except this team versus uh, Sam actually could have done exactly the same, with a bit of support to clean up the team. Um, with you know the Terminator being sub smash, I'm assuming, and dual stabs, with the Draco Z. So, I just I just don't see it because like it's it's a were, decent were matchup. Floatzel is Floatzel isn't the end all be all. Sam doesn't have a water resist, but it's not okoing anything. It's not coming in for free. But like a lot more, it, it wasn't a bad matchup either. I don't think it wasn't a yeah, bad I'd matchup. Say, yeah, I'd it say it wasn't if I could just good matchup. Yeah, if I could just interject quickly, I think if you look at the value tom gets per mon on sam's team you'd expect tom to have the matchup but i think sam's team does a good job of not relieving the momentum which is like an important aspect uh Mm -hmm. when you consider that and that's how that's how sam rolls like he has no fire water grass resist or a lot of other things you know but his team is reliant on keeping up momentum abusing you know, Mudsdale's annoyingly fat, and Stoutland is annoyingly good at just hitting buttons, and you know, just 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 doing the general Sam I Am stuff. So the fact that there's none of that overall to me makes the team questionable. But it it, it it's it's not the worst in this matchup at all. It's still it's still functional. But yeah. what we saw like very early on, Sam got to completely break through the Metang with his Stoutland because he got a lot of turns to hit frustration and stuff like that. Like Tom was thoroughly on the back foot the entire time playing super defensively. Part of that was because Sam did get a, um, a turn two wake up that definitely hurt Tom. 
Although at the same time, you could say that Tom losing so much off the turn two wake up was also not ideal in the slightest. Yeah, I'd so, say if your if your wink on is like talking about like a turn two wake up, like that's still that's still kind of dodgy if you ask me. I don't think that's like I don't think you can like reasonably justify that as like oh I got fucked over because this Pokemon woke up in two turns. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. I feel like it was almost just trying so hard to win the game just there. Yeah. I feel like he was nervous almost. Like he was trying to win the game as quickly as possible rather than the best way possible. Mm-hmm. And I'll, also, I know I mentioned this like briefly, I think, before we started, but I don't think the Shinotic pick did very much for Tom. I don't think defensive fat Shinotic is in general good versus what Sam brings. And I don't think the concept of the Shinotic plus the Metang, uh, plus the Turtonator, plus the Floatzel, like you're really... This kind of team, Tom needs to have momentum, which is what Sam is all about. And Sam got it, and you know he did his normal thing. And because Tom never had it, his wasn't the team that could afford to play passively like this at all. Like I said, Metang literally just... Yeah got chipped through by Stoutland hitting frustration on it over and over because he kept getting opportunities to frustrate. That that shouldn't... Like, your your team isn't good versus what Sam does. Well, I just think it was defensive backbone in Tom's team that just sucked ass. Yeah. The Shinotic Metang backbone is not a good pick. It, I also... it just seeped momentum. And... Mm-hmm. It just meant that, like, let's say he had a Mudsdale instead of Metang there, and, like, Eel instead of uh, Shinotic. It just, I don't know, there's no fighting resist, but it's actually better than what he's got there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I I think the thing with Tom's team is that it's sort of like Gary the Gengar's team, which we criticised quite heavily. I think it's that, but on a much more, like, low-key level, where it's, like, he has loads of mods that in theory do well versus Sam, but none of them help each other. None of them like are cohesive enough. They don't like help each other win the game. And I feel like that was what was missing. Like Shinotic, sure, it does okay, but it's like it's it's a girder check, but you need to like follow it up with more like uh, checks for like let's say Primate, because Primate can gunk shot it and he doesn't really have a secondary Primate switch in. Turtonator, you know, it breaks on eel teams, but he doesn't have anything to really abuse that void. You know what I mean? Mm. And then, like, the mods are so individual in the same way that Gary's was individual. It's just because it looks a bit more legit, like, each mod looks cool, and it's a bit more like, I, I can see why you pick these things, but, like, I, I think it falls flat on its face because, He's, like, there is yeah, no, no like, real synergy. L- l- individually, I think the best example is, why is Floatzel here? Like, it doesn't make yeah. sense. It's meant to be speed control, I get that, because Scarf Primeape isn't always the most reliable revenge killer, but... You're not you should, really breaking four yeah. float. Like, the things that Turtonator is going to be killing, Turtonator is not going to kill a Pharisee. No, nothing on your team is meant to kill a Pharisee. So, Floatzel's just kind of stuck there because it's pressuring something completely different than everything else. That kind yeah, of stuff. Like, it, Floatzel, Floatzel's best thing, the best thing flo- about Floatzel in this, like, entire tier is that it can go hard in on Frostlass and click Pursuit for, like, no repercussions because of Water Veil and its speed tier. And then it can, like, spam fast liquidations, right? But he doesn't need any of that. Like, he, he doesn't need the, the Pursuit on Floatzel. So why even go after it in the first place? It kind of confuses me. I don't yeah. know. I feel like he just used Floatzel because of the prep idea of yeah, he doesn't use water resist. Let's use it. But yeah, no, I mean, it, it makes sense. And there's a lot yeah. wrong or like yeah. questionable about Sam's team where it does lack those kind of resists, but it is really good at that specific momentum thing. So it didn't work in practice. Yeah, it's, it reminds me a lot of how like Case used to build Teddy, if you remember like how he used to build, where it was like, I have loads of momentum and I have loads of weaknesses, but it, realistically, how are you going to abuse these weaknesses? You know what I mean? Like, even, like, with Case's mono teams, he would have, like, let's say, his team would, let's say, be 6 0 by Combuskin, but he always used to say, well, the Combuskin has to land all of its Fire Blast. I think that's the same thing here, but, like, on a much more micro level, where it's, like, Sam can outplay instead of, like, dodging stuff. You know what I mean? Mm. I feel like your example there was really shit. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yes, but also because no one listening is going to know who Cased is. Let's be real. But shout outs if you know Cased. And shout outs Cased. Yeah, it, it didn't work, and Tom got just thoroughly outplayed regardless. No one's going to disagree with that one. He just. Yeah. Sam just hit all the buttons and won, and similar to yeah. Ryza, like, you versus Ziri, and then obviously Tasker versus Soul Gaze. There's a lot more to talk about on, like, turn-by-turn turn individual important stuff, but these three games, uh, yeah, I don't know, Bob. Yeah, I just massively pissed off Ted, but, I mean, let's continue. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> you guys take the lead on Tasker versus Soul Gaze, or I'm talking too much. Uh, Okay. <clears throat> I mean, Task of the was quite an interesting game. Like, I personally quite enjoyed it, especially, like, given that, like, Soul Gazer is, like, a, more, a much more, like, respected tour player. Um, and he brought, like, a kind of a serious-looking, kind of meme ish team. And then Task mm-hmm. brought, like, a much more, like, he brought a Hakamo, so instantly his team is considered, like, a meme. But on top of that, he has three ice types as well. So, um, I think... I like I kind of like the look of Soulgazer's team. Like apart, aside from like, there's a couple of weaknesses that I'd point out. I think overall it's actually pretty strong. I also like. I mean, T spikes aren't that great in this meta, but you have Drift Limb to abuse the Victory Bell regardless. So um, I don't hate the idea. Uh, I will say it's a bit cool, uh, eel weak potentially. Um, yeah. But I mean, you have you have Kangas gun, you have Absol to abuse eel, so I, d- I don't even hate that as well. So, yeah, what do you think? Well, then? I think Tasker probably got his prep a bit wrong here. Absolutely. I think, okay. I, I mean, maybe it's because I have a long standing history of Soul Gazer. Um, I, just, I just know that he, he loves his, his spikes. Yeah. Uh, so, seeing uh, Hakamo and. I don't know. I just think Hakamo was not the pick for Soul Gazer. I feel like it's a yeah, pick I think, for a different person. I feel like, well, yeah. like I said in the predicts, Soul Gazer has a lot to go off on Tasker. Tasker has nothing to go off uh, versus Soul Gazer. And I feel like he went, okay, well, Soul Gazer's <laughs> not the most, you know, he's a tour player who's only just getting into the meta. He's probably going to bring a lot of meta stuff. So I'll bring Hakamo and I'll check the Victory Bell and the Electros and that kind of stuff. And yeah. Soul Gazer didn't do that at all. He went out doing his own thing, a pretty cool thing. I agree there are some weaknesses, some oddities, but overall I think the team is pretty functional and strong. Uh, Hakamo did at least completely wall the Drift Blim because it was a uh, special you know, Shadow Ball that gets bulletproofed, but uh, certainly not what he wanted to have in this matchup. Uh, yeah, I, I think I will say... Uh, I did talk to Tasker prior to this week starting, and he, he had no idea how to prep for, uh, to, for why did I say false, Soul Gazer as well. I told him uh, how to prep for Soul Gazer, you make sure you have good things versus spikes. In SPL, he brought eight out of nine spikes, and those are like, that's like a quote from that I said to him. Um, eight out of nine times he brought Goblin Bordor, I think, in an SPL, where he went like seven and two. So it's clear that he's like, his comfort zone is clearly spikes. Like You put him in a, in a meta where there's like loads of spikes everywhere, he'll be comfortable there and he'll do well. So I think, yeah, as Ted said, I think it was it's probably a bit better to come with a bit less passive, like on a one-for-month like level, something a bit less passive, like Sableye and Hakamo, uh, Quillfish as well. Like Quillfish is like kind of spikes fodder if you have like, if Soul Gazer brought a Frostlass, for example. So um, yeah, I, I agree. Tusk got his preps slightly wrong, but I do think he played uh, quite well. I think just Soul Gazer got uh, a lot of the plays where it mattered right, um, despite Tasker, you know, sort of trying to edge an advantage almost out of the game. Ah, I can spot where the game turned. Yeah, and it it is interesting that in theory, at least, uh, despite Hakmo O and the overall construction not being great, Hale still could have been a big problem for Soul Gazer. He had to multiple times pivot. Uh, into uh, Quillfish, into Cryogonal, back into Quillfish to like keep the Sand Slash in check. It's just that with Tasker not having anything else scary enough, that wasn't enough for him. Uh, Hail, Hail wasn't enough for him, and Soulgazer just kind of kept himself healthy 
uh, kept himself safe. And even though it came down uh, pretty close overall and definitely helped that the Sand Slash wasn't Iron Head, uh, able to eke out the win with his Cryogonal being really good late game uh, versus Tasker's yeah. team. Um, yeah, I will also I will also say that the weird thing about Tasker's team is that Sand Slash has to do both the breaking and the cleaning all in one slot, and it having like no like set role. Like when you put Sand Slash and this is your set breaker, it functions mm-hmm. completely like Rotom's a you bit don't of have a breaker. to its health as much. Well, no, I'm talking about like it's like if you want to get past something bulky, Rotom isn't going to get past that, but Sand Slash might. So like, let's say like a throwing a random one out there like Type Null, like let's say Soulgate's brought Type Null, like your 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 way of like making sure uh, really bulky stuff takes a lot of damage and pressuring that is is via Sand Slash. So when you have like the whole breaking and cleaning role all wrapped into one Pokemon, I feel like that one in particular got overwhelmed over the course of the matchup with like too much responsibility almost, and other ones like like in the end Hack and Mo and like Saber like. They don't really do anything, so I think he could have uh, benefited a lot from a different selection there, which I think is going to bite, will haunt him over like when he reflects on this game. Soulgazer's team is also a lot more active, whereas Tasker's is weirdly passive for Hale, kind of with the you know fatter Sableye, Quillfish, Hecmo stuff, as opposed to Soulgazer. Um, he's got the SD Absol and the Figgy Kanga. And the Cryogonal as more like immediate uh, threats with the latter two also having a lot more defensive presence. Like I feel like when you, when you go SD Absol, you have to be very confident in your team and your play. Is like I am going to be able to generate uh, the kind of offensive pressure I need to be able to really effectively use this. And he, he was like if Tasker hasn't hadn't burned with the Quillfish, that SD Absol was absolutely going in. So. Well, I feel like team selection let Tasker down with the Hakamo. Mm. Um, I feel like Hakamo could have worked there, but bulk up Dragon Tail. Like, I feel like it was like a, it's like a you can't kill this Hakamo. This is how like it's like throw abusing like, spikes, but not throw. Exactly. Yeah. I just I I, I don't like it. Either. Mm. Uh, because if it was Drain Punch, it got enough chip on the cryo. If it was toxic, it could toxic the cryo, chew a hit, rest up, do something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, I just. I don't think I don't think toxic one here. I think it had to be Drain Punch, but. No, I feel like you could have gone Hakamo earlier in the game. Oh uh, yeah, like yeah, okay, different different chances, yeah, but. Overall, yeah, the uh, yeah. team selection was not there, and then. Soulgazer played it really well. Tasker didn't play badly at all, but Soulgazer kept himself a step ahead with the way he was keeping hazards off. He was using a lot of cryo. He pivoted around the sand slash, and uh, the way he got SD Absol to that to that point, we're like, this game came down extremely close. But also keep in mind, Tasker had to get a Scald Burn, uh, or else Soulgazer just played that SD Absol like so strongly that it was pretty much just going to ensure him the victory. Uh, when he got the sword stance there. Yeah, I think I think we've we've called out a lot of people on this podcast already for having teams that lacked synergy, and I think Soulgazer's team was like the opposite of that. Like his team is very well. It, it has a lot of synergy. It works really well together, and each one breaks for each other's weakness like really well. So, I I personally think this is this is more how people need to start thinking about building as like a cohesive unit rather than six individual Pokemon that might be able to cheese a matchup in each of their own rights. Because I think in a, in a meta as momentum-based as the one that we have right now, it's it's so important that you're able to like identify your win con early and then also play it out. Like That's how everybody's getting their wins right now. It's like you identify how you're going to win and then you play for that win con, even if it means sacking off everything to get there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we've Maybe also... Everything. We've also been really critical of teams because uh, it's kind of like easy to do that from our perspective. It's obviously hard to build and respect that, but I think it is critical to note that the people with like the the oldest players with the most out of PU experience, Teddy, Ryza, Soulgazer, had the teams that were definitely 
uh, the most into. I guess save Gary the Gengar, who clearly has not gotten a handle on this tier at all. Um, but it, it is notable yeah. that from mains like, okay, the Ziri to Lenet core, uh, the, the false Jad core, uh, the Tom Holland, the Sam, the Sam I am plus Jerry plus Rexus, not having the teams, uh, e- even Tasker, not having the teams that we were the most impressed with. Um, that's something that humans are going to need to step up on. Obviously, that's think- very blanket to say humans because like you, you are, and we liked your team. Ryza pretty much is so. I think what I've like noticed so far with you know Snake is that I think the tier uh, PU as a tier has actually lived up to hype and actually exceeded expectations. I think with PU Open and you know PU and Snake, I actually really like the game. Some of the games that we produced. I think that the player base, however, I think the building there's just a real skill gap. And I'm not saying I'm really good at building, but I can, I, I can safely say that I, I feel like I can notice meta trends better than, let's say, Gary the Gengar's team, or you know Tom Holland, who don't really have. I don't feel like we, they have the same grip on the meta as you know somebody else. I'm not trying to toot my own trumpet here. No, I, I feel like I get it. I feel like you know. As as the weeks will go on, team building will only get better. And yeah, I the think players will only get better. And the tier is really living yeah, up we to. Have, we have seven weeks left of left of just group stages. So. Yeah, I think I think the difference is between this tier and let's say like and you are you uh, other low tiers in general that in those tiers there's a specific like meta team and if you go off of that meta team you seek or you tend to have like huge drop-offs in like the mons that you're using and everything gets much worse off of that one meta team. I think how we balance the tier as a council over the course of uh, SM and how proactive we've been with like community feedback and all of that stuff, we've managed to develop a meta where you can go off brand and off meta and get an advantage, but so easy you can, if you go off meta, like you, you can really screw it up. Um, like, you can't just cheese people out with an off meta team. You can't do that. You can you have to build something which is actually good and makes sense from a team building perspective. Otherwise you will get smoked. Yeah. And I think when we say meta, what we think of is the uh Mud's Eel Vic Mud's. meta. And yeah, like we said earlier, this is a very standard, easy, almost lazy core in that like this is what you can use to build like that simple, uh solid team. But it's entirely possible to build around that and beat that. It's entirely possible for the best people who are winning to come up with something new that gives that core issues, but it's also uh, entirely possible for the best players to be using that and having plenty of success with that. It's really... I, I don't think it's overly dominant. I think we're seeing a ton of it, but I don't think it's overly dominant. I don't think it's actually a, a problematic amount because there's so much to do in this tier. And we'll keep seeing yeah. it. I, Ted won't toot his own trumpet, but I will. Um, I well, like the the detonates in PUPL. Like this is how we had such a big advantage is that we identified like this is this is like the standard. We were the first person to make it a standard essentially, and that's why I think we we fared really well in the in PUPL as a whole, especially in SM. Mm-hmm. I think I'm, I'm just gonna point out that. I feel like a lot of the credit actually goes to Dibs uh, in identifying <laughs> meta, fight, meta trends. Um, yeah. Like when it came to PUPL, I think I think you started building some really jank shit for week one, and I was like, no, <laughs> let's reuse some teams that I built in the exhibition, which was like six months prior. But in the exhibition, I had you know Rotom and Frost. I had Eel, I had Muds, I had Reggie, Eel, you know, I had, I, I literally, I, I went to, you know, Dibs, I was like, is there any reason to not run Electros? And it is, is there any reason why you should not run Eel in current meta? No, 
I think Eel is like one of those Pokemon where you're going to get value with it in like every matchup right now. I, it's so like it re- the meta is almost revolving around it. I think level, I think that might. I think that might be a bit strong, as at least in terms of usage. Like, yeah, you're seeing an awful lot of eel, but you know, Teddy did not use eel, Soul Gizzard did not use eel, Tasker did not use eel, um, Tom Holland did not use eel, False did yeah, not use eel. It's it's. it's I don't yeah, think it's, it's entirely fair to say that you know there's no reason not to use eel. It's, like the same way I think Frostlass is an S rank that's literally always going to be good if you have it on your team, but that doesn't mean you have to always use it. Um, eh. Yeah, I think. Really, I think I, I don't know. I, I I don't think there's ever a game where, where you're like Frostlass. This isn't useful. You can't do anything. That doesn't happen. I feel like that's because the best speed control in the meta is uh, Scarf Primeape. Yeah, that too. Yeah, but whatever the reasoning, it is like that. Um. The, yeah, we are at. The last game. That was the last game. And was it the last game? Yeah, nice. five games. So we're at one hour and six minutes. Let's jump into these uh, week three matchups. Uh, okay. Ryza versus Ktut. I actually. We had a lot of prediction posts in the main slam thread as opposed to the. Uh, P in the main snake thread as opposed to the PU form specific snake thread and I saw people going back and forth on who they expect I definitely am going to have to go Ryza Katut got back to his like I can bring jank stuff and jank you out but we've still only seen it for one game whereas Ryza's looked pretty solid for two and until Katut can really show he's back to just being able to uh, jank people out like he need he needs to he needs to show that the more he does that the more he'll rise up but I don't think it looks like he's solidly back yet. I feel yeah, like I, looking I at like that the match up. Rise up, get it, rise up, rise up. Oh, <laughs> God, why am I in this? God damn, <laughs> shit, cool. Oh. <laughs> um, rise up versus Cater. I feel like this one's come too soon to predict. Yeah, they're both yeah. too relatively unknown. They both started 2 0. Kata arguably could be 0 2. Riser. Well, at least 1 1 from the task game. Probably deserves, you know, his 2 0. But Riser's also played uh, Ziri and Gary the Gengar, who are both 0 2. And arguably the two weakest in the pool. Or maybe, maybe bottom three, uh, given, you know, Shake and Tom Holland. Yeah, that's team. fair. So I feel like it's it's near impossible to predict this. Um, based off recent performances, I feel like people will be going with Riser. I feel like Kata is better at counter teaming and counter styling, though. So yeah, no, I agree. I feel like Kata's probably got the edge here. Uh, he's going to bring yeah. some jank. Riser is stuck to meta, and he's done meta really well, making subtle adjustments. But I reckon Kata will rock up with some setup spam with several win conditions and overpower whatever meta team Riser's going to bring. And I feel like, even though I probably want Riser to win because Kata plays a bit of the villain in PU, uh, you know, everyone's going to want Riser to win, but he'll probably end up losing in some hacks way and Kata's going to get his, you know, 3 0 and he's going to be on Eternal Spirits team, so. Yeah, the I mean whole, the whole community is like, you know, they're they're playing the villain card. He's either gonna yeah. luck his way through, he's gonna, or he's gonna roll up with the, the bulk up Grand Bull, and Rise is gonna be, oh lords, I have been spanked by this set that I have not thought of, or Rise is just gonna um, be too solid for it. And like you said, yeah. it, it's a it's a little early to make us make serious thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I think Ted Ted is like looking at it as a more like destructive. In a way, like he's looking at it like a worst case scenario. Oh, this is what's going to happen. This is what's always been happening. I take a more positive uh, approach. Well, I positive in terms of like uh, Riser's chances in this game. I think I've enjoyed how Riser has been prepping for the meta at the moment, and I think he can he'll know more than anybody that Katut's going to bring some jank. So I'm kind of interested to see what Riser does to prepare for that. Like what style of team he brings, what type of 
the speed control he brings, all of that type of stuff. I want to see how he tries to prepare for Kata. Um, and I'm really interested to see the outcome because I feel like if Ryza wins this, he could potentially go on to have like a really, really good snake. Like a, I'm talking like, you know, eight one seven two like yeah. all those lines. Really like, think well, a three zero like, start for either of them. If he beats Kata, yeah. Like if he beats yeah, Kata, he's well, still I got to face can... like Soulgazer. He's still got to face me, Tasker, Folds. Yeah, that's a fair thing Teddy brought up. Where Ryza's wins were Ziri and Gary probably the weakest people we've we've seen say maybe like the lindworms yeah. core so that is that is fair where a three zero start would be amazing for him but then he's going to start running into tasker teddy false Elias, or all that yeah, uh Z- uh, let's let's uh, let's keep let's keep moving uh ziri versus sam i am they're both zero two no i'm sorry sam i am's one one sam i am's one one ziri zero ziri zero two but this one's still kind of hard um ziri's had some like prep issues the ziri planet core has not come out amazing so far but sam has shown yep i'm gonna keep using the same exact sam i am stuff you know i'm using every time and i really wouldn't be surprised if ziri rocks up with something that does much better than his attempted counter team of teddy and uh ends up put, pulling uh, up an advantage because of that i'll put money on sam using frost last primate <laughs> Sam's going to be listening to this, and he's not going to rig Frost that primate. <laughs> no, but he's he's just going to bring every other Sam on. He won't he won't use those, but he'll still use Muds, Eel, um, Stoutland, Rotom again or something. I I honestly heavily favor uh, Sam in this one, like more than people would expect, maybe because I have faith in him as a player. Uh, he makes bad plays sometimes, and he doesn't think straight. But I think overall, he's proven to be like like he's very good at identifying like when to double, when to play aggressively. I think the key thing, though, is that he's found like a rhythm almost in the teams that he likes to use, and he can play well. Whereas I don't think Ziri has that yet. I don't think Ziri and Telenet have found that like build a player like core yet, or struck a chord together where it's like, yeah, this is the team that you like. I'm going to build exactly that, and it's going to be great. Like I don't think they've hit that yet. I think they might hit it later on in the tour, but I think Sam just he just knows what he likes better than Telenet knows what Ziri likes. See, the way I see this, I think Zeri and Telenet will win the prep war, and Zeri will play marginally well, but Sam will still win somehow because he knows how to close out games, whereas I feel like Zeri doesn't. Yeah, I think that could be almost a product of the builds as well. Like, if if Zeri isn't comfortable with the team, like, he's not going to be able to play the end game well, which is going to be, like, the, 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 the deciding factor almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which leads us on to Bushmasters and Lindworms. Yeah, Bushmasters, I think, is the most one-sided prediction here. Tom is looking like a, an average new player who has some solid building ideas, but is a bit out of his depth, and Tasker has not looked bad. He's 0-2, but... Not a terrible showing versus Soul Gazer, a bit off the money on the prep, and then the Katut game he should have won. I, 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 Tom, it's not that Tom can't win, but I don't see why I would predict in his favor. Yeah, I don't think I don't think anybody would predict in Tom's favor in this game. Uh, not to knock Tom, but I think you have to respect Tasker more than you have to respect Tom at the moment. Um, also, I think Tom is like in this in this weird state. Where I feel like he was Jari almost in like, like SPL. You remember Jari in SPL? Uh, yeah, SPL like his first SPL. Yeah, where he was breaking onto the scene. He'd had a couple of good results, but he seemed out of his depth in like a bigger tour stage. I think Tom might get to the stage where Jari is now, where he's like Jari is a pretty good player. Like he's picked up in almost every PL now. He makes good like good runs in almost all the tours that he plays in because like he now understands how to play the game. I feel like Tom is almost like a Jari, but like. Roll, roll the ears back a few more. So the way I yeah. way I see it, I, I agree with you. Um, I do feel like Tom has potential. I, I again agree with the same sentiment for Telenet. I feel like they were both picked up a year early. They need another yeah. year in the scene, another year experience to actually perform in a tournament like this. I almost feel like Tom is, was really good at networking himself to get himself drafted. Uh, I, I, I described it well, yeah. as, a, as like a, an American sitcom where 
they get themselves into uh, a bit of a situation where they're like, yeah, this is a really good idea. And then it's not a good idea. And things just go from bad to worse in like American sitcom style. And Tom's snake career, as much as I love the person as like, you know, he's, he's, he's a really lovely chap. But he, he just, he's just spiraling where like, he managed to, you know, get enough clout to get himself drafted, to get starting in week two. And then to have a showing like that against Sam, it just shows just how inexperienced and how vulnerable he is. He, he, need, he needs to beat Tasker now, or or, or, or it's going to go downhill real bad. He's going to be stapled to the bench, uh, like uh, Forever. Yama's log with Indigo Plateau. <laughs> Yeah. Which we learned all about for no reason. <laughs> that was great. Okay, Kushlos versus Teddy. Um, I rate Kushlos very highly. I buy him in everything, but we're not predicting against Teddy because that's. I'm, that's, I'm not going to uh, comment on this one. Because, that's, no, uh, don't com- don't comment on your own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I won't comment. Well, what, what? Actually, no. I like. I am going to comment. Um, I think Ted's going to get spanked. <clears throat> I think I'll okay, like it. Okay. Okay. K- Kushlos <laughs> needs to get a team down. Gary, like, people are like, oh yeah, Gary's not bad. It's like, how do we know his teams have been stupid? Kushlos is a really good player, and if he actually gets the team down, yeah, he could absolutely outplay Teddy. Teddy's really good. Kushlos is really good too, but Teddy's been bringing some hot stuff. Even if it has Hakama O, I still forgive him, and <laughs> Kushlos. I don't know what he's going to do for teams. If he's building, he, he doesn't tend to do that for PU. Who knows how that's going to turn out. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm super interested in what Kush brings to PU because usually he has a lot of fresh ideas, even though, like, he's not one to, like, put them in a team himself. Like, usually, he usually takes considerable part. And now he has skin in the game. Like, in Gar- when Gary was playing, I feel like Kush didn't have skin in the game, so he didn't really care, like, like what Gary brought. Like, you do you, bro. You can do whatever you want. Like, you're going to win the game. Like, that type of teammate. But now he has skin in the game. Now he's actually in the slot. Like, he's going to take prep much more seriously. He's not going to have the same gaps that Gary might have because he's generally, I think, a much more solid player. And he does well in PU tours. So, um, yeah, I think I'm interested to see what Kish would bring. I think he'll bring something slightly more standard just to make sure he has a chance. I think Teddy will have the bigger chance and then we'll win the game. Mm-hmm. I don't think he'll get smacked. Or, like said. or Red J builds again they just get smacked. Either way. <laughs> yeah, that too. that too. If any of you guys find out what Kush is bringing, uh, can you let me know? <laughs> that, would, that would be cheating. <laughs> we have integrity or here on guided helping. the Untier Talk. Okay, Soulgazer is versus False. It's definitely the highlight. Or me versus Kush is the highlight. Cause Yours is Kush is the highlight if Kush gets a good team. Soul Gazer versus False is more of a guaranteed highlight, I think. It's really, like, this last week we saw Soul Gazer bring, like, a really hot, fresh, exciting team. And False it's showing, like, where where the False Ajad building can go deadly wrong. So there's a lot... Go wrong? There's a lot riding. I, there's I, a lot riding on this game for the improvement, but I think False is still an absolutely solid player. I think you and him have definitely have the ability to cook something up uh, really strong versus Soulgazer and have a much better idea than most other people in the pool how to actually prep versus someone with such uh, little to go off of wait, from wait, P on, specifically. On, can we can we just pause it for a sec? I I've just noticed there's a playing his snake debut versus Lycans in UU. Can we can we have our like F in the chat for Derza? Did you see oh. Sna- did you see Shake's prediction? No, I didn't. Who Sh- actually reads his posts? Uh Durza was reposting his prediction where Shake was like, haha he's gonna get smacked or whatever. So Well it's because he's gonna get smacked. Yeah. That's not the point. <laughs> D- Durza, Durza and Tom Holland are starting in Snake. This is we are truly living in in the millennium. In the millennium. No, Durza, if he was starting in RU, that would be a genuine shout. But he just so happens to be drafted on a team with Nat, who is top two. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Soulgazer versus Force. It's like Ajna um, with forty nine. The way I see it, it's like. 
feel like Fulce really showed his cracks as a player last week, um, whereby he's not particularly higher tier and he changed sets from, you know, good prep and good sets into bad sets. It almost makes me feel like he's he he's he's shown his like he's vulnerable. His limits. Whereas Solgaza is the punisher of plates. He is the French Canadian person who will He's, he's the Ajama of PU. That's who he is. The, the French Canadian person who who will also play well in his nationality has nothing to do with it. Well, he, he is uh, he he speaks French, so you know that he means business, and he's a mean user, so he's basically a Ajama. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to I counteract that, but who's been French in PU? Evie is. I think Evie is from the same place as Solgazer. I think. Right, so we don't like Evie as well because she's French. Wow. Okay. So yeah, just th- throwing your player under the bus. Now throwing your co-manager under the bus. God, it just sucks. Like, I I love Evie. I think Evie is fantastic. In fact, yo 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 yo, potential couple. Anyone? <laughs> yeah. What? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so these are first false. It's gonna be fun and close. It's gonna be interesting to see what they bring. Looking forward to it. Let's let's just. Come on, it's been an hour and 20 minutes. Let's just do Hajad's gimmick corner and wrap it up. Yeah, I just, I think Solgaz is, I, I hate Solgaz a lot, but you have to respect him. Like, he's such a good player. Like, okay. But yeah. <laughs> I hate him, but he's I good. And you have that. to respect that. Fuck you, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. You're all right, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, that's the ultimate compliment, I guess. Um, yeah, gimmick corner. Ted, do you have any gimmicks? Because I haven't thought of mine yet. Uh, if you don't, I have one for. I've got one that I used in ZU. Okay, but I feel like it might be decent for PU. Go for it. Yeah, sure, whatever. So we're looking at Driftblim. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're talking uh, Endure Destiny Bond, Berry, Driftblim. What, like Nietzsche Berry? Any Berry. In in this particular team, I had Pataya Berry with Shadow Ball and Seabolt for Marini. Okay. But I feel like it could be a good Electros law, whereby you you know you chew the hit, you get your berry down, you click Destiny Bond, you get two kills, etc. Yeah, that seems annoying. Yeah, just kind of awkward yeah. to fit on a team, you know. Yeah, like at least at least Soul Gazer is like okay, it's kind of a, a secondary Vic check, so I can I can see where you might want to fit it defensively, but then. It makes doing the whole Destiny Bond Berry it's thing a little a harder. Longer. It will, um, I don't know. You know, you could run yeah, it, it with like things. Acro. Yeah, it could do things. I mm. think Driftblim in general, because we all know that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of PU is is uh, Dips the Dreamer. And if Dips the Dreamer says something is good, then it's good. So Driftblim is by default a good Pokemon. Yeah, game. and so is um, Cherim. Either that or scarf regular sand slash. No, okay. Um, I have a real thing. Hajad, <laughs> okay, Hajad told me to use. Hajad told me to use it, so it, it counts as yours. Uh, Specs Omastar is actually pretty cool. Um, Jellicent kind of fell out of popularity as a Specs user because all these, you know, pursuit and the fact that Water Spout ends up not being amazing. And Je- Jellicent's strong for PU, but that special attack's still only 85. Omastar has a special attack of 115. That's 30 special attack higher. This thing just hits like a truck. Like Plus it hits, like, you have Earth Power to hit, like, Lantern as well, so you don't get boned by either Electros or Lantern, which is huge, I think. Yeah, you have, you have um, Earth like Power, so Earth, Earth Power Ice Beam coverage is great, and then you can go either d- dual Water Stabs or Hidden Power Electric, either way. But, like, if you look for yeah. Mons with Special Attack over, totally over 100 in PU, most of them are kind of conditional. Like, Electros isn't much of a breaker, Haunter's a bit uh, iffy, uh, Manectric and Rotom can be also be, like, somewhat hit or miss if you run to the strong Electric checks. Omastar really can just button pretty nicely, and uh, Weak Armor is also dope, because you can just pivot into, like, oh, you have a uh, Primeape and I caught a U-turn? Well, now I'm a 
plus two speed choice specs Omastar have fun. It's like it's not the most amazing thing ever, but strong breaker, nothing wrong with it. Kind of the same vein where people were messing with camera up, like, oh, this is just gonna randomly kill things every time. Yeah, I think also um, when I suggested that set to you, I said that you could potentially use toxic spikes as a filler because at the at that particular time I was like messing around with potential things that could uh, clip T spikes for like a Kangaskhan or whatever. So it's not only a breaker in the fact that it's a spec one, it can also lay a T spike if there is that specific weakness uh, mm -hmm. on that team. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, specs almost are in its own right. It's a, it's a super good. Yeah. And like right, aside yeah. for aside from Ferrisseed and the rare yeah. water absorb Jellicent, really nothing is gonna want to be pivoting in on it multiple times. So it's it, yeah. it's fun. Can I, I do, really can I do my one? really enjoyed it. Can I do my one? That was yours. Fine. It's it's not your one well, anymore. It's 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 your one now. I give I I'll hand the copyright over to to Bibby now. He owns, he owns the set. Yeah. He's joke. You're not my dad. I certainly am, and I will tell you why. Because the set that I think is the the best, the the, the gimmick corner set of the week is Nasty Plot Gracium Symphony Ball with 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 Hydro Ice Ice Beam, and then Grass Knot, but with Z Grass Knot as well. Because 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 Simi Ball is actually a good one, and people underrate it a lot. I mean, that sounds like what I would run on Simipore. Like, that seems like it would be the standard thing. I was running Iceium and Guzzlord meta, but now Grassium. Well, maybe yep. maybe uh, Z Focus Blast for the Pharisees and stuff. But other than that, like, yeah. it's, pr it's, 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 probably a, it's probably a bit underexplored. Why not Water Rim Z? For Eel. Uh, Lantern. Lantern. You should, well, it's like you could pick Water Rim to hit Eel, or you could pick Grassy to hit Lantern. But I feel right. like Eel, you, need, you can you can chip Eel super easy over the course of a game, and then click Nasty Plot and then Hydro Pump it. But Lantern, it's much harder to kill because Grass Knot does like 20 BP to it. So I prefer Grassy MZ in that case. Then run Focus Blast, and then run Whirlpool Lantern to uh, trap Opposing Lantern. No, meta meta is fun. Water spam whirlpool lantern. Water spam whirlpool lantern plus semi pour. Absolutely meta as fuck. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna lose full composure when Ted brings that to Kushalos. I I'm gonna literally <laughs> lose it. You think he's gonna last an hour and twenty five minutes in this video? Or maybe yeah, it's, it's, it, it's an hour, it's been an hour and twenty seven actually. Speaking of which, uh, we should probably. It's been a long one, but this is also the first time we had you on, so that's that's fine. I think people will be I think people will be a lot more interested in in your perspective. Like you get a, you get ours every week, and that's nice. But uh, you don't you don't get to hear from Teddy all the time. And as like the big the big number one ranked snake starter, uh, I think it's absolutely justified to have this 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 big long episode. So, oh, you flatter me, you, you cuties. PPL champ and 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 somewhat of a builder PPL himself. That's a funny stuff. I I am the self-proclaimed procrastinator. Procrast procrastinator, lady killer. Um, what else? Somewhat of a builder uh, himself. H. Don't forget. Abuser. Yeah, dibs lover, all of the above. Oh, I do love I do love a bit of dibs. Same. Okay. Um, th this, this is getting a little, a little weirdly Brit for me, so I think I'm just gonna sneak, sneak over to this, uh, stop recording <laughs> button and just, uh, just cut this out right about now.